Hey everyone, I've got a special video for you today that I have done by request. So we're going to go ahead and jump into cardiovascular EKG and ECG basics. Welcome to CASRN, where I teach you about all things nursing. What we're going to cover in this video is a review of the electrical conduction through the heart, how the EKG strip basics the EKG pattern basics and normal readings. Because the reality here is that there's no way for you to understand abnormal EKGs if you don't first understand normal EKGs. First off, we've got, uh, this is just the basic heart, right? So we've got the atria that are gonna be up here, and then you've got the ventricles that are down here on the bottom, and then you have your right side and your left side. Now remember that we always look at things in the anatomical view, and so while we're looking at the screen and this is our left side, it's actually the right side of the patient and vice versa over here. All right, so first off, we're gonna go through the electrical conduction. We've got the SA node or the sinoatrial node, which is up here in the right atrium. This is where the impulse starts in, to go through the electrical conduction of the heart. Then that's gonna go ahead and jump down into the AV node, which is the atrioventricular node. So that's you're gonna be your node right here. And then this is gonna send up the, the impulse and it's going to be picked up in the bundle of his. And then you've got your left and your right bundle branches, which then come down here and they go into the Purkinje fibers. And as these electrical impulses go through the muscle, this is what's going to cause it to contract and then ultimately force the blood through the aorta and out to the rest of the body. So the right atria is going to, or the atria are going to contract first, and then that impulse comes down, and then it's going to cause the ventricles to contract. Here is a basic EKG strip. Uh, this is just a really generic form and it's got a couple imperfections, but it's uh, what I could find that was available. EKGs are measured using two units. We've got amplitude and duration, or you can also think of that as voltage and time. So the voltage is going to run up and down and the time is going to run left to right. So the way that I remember that is that if I got shocked, I would jump up, right? So uh, rather than jumping left to right. So when we look at a strip, we, the strength of the electrical impulses is going to be this up and down, while the heart rate itself is going to be left to right. So then in this next box here, uh, this represents what you're going to see on a strip because a strip is just made out of boxes. We've got these big boxes and then there's some smaller boxes inside of it. So this box is measured five millimeters or 0.0 or 0.20 seconds in duration. It's also done with five millimeters or five millivolts in amplitude. So five of these large boxes equals one second on an EKG strip. So you can see over here, we only have four. So we've got one, two, three, and four. So this isn't even a full second on an EKG screen. So then we've got the small box and there's five of those inside the big box. And that is gonna represent one millimeter, which is 0.04 seconds in time or 0.1 millivolts. I wouldn't get too caught up in these numbers. Um, I'd be really surprised if you're gonna get a lot of test questions on these really small numbers, but it creates an understanding on how you're gonna be able to count pulse later on with an EKG. So go ahead and remember that timing because we are going to come back to that in a later video. Basically, if you can just remember how many boxes equals a second, you'll be able to do the counting methods that you need to learn to pass your tests. All right, so next up, we've got just a regular EKG pattern, which is this. This is where you, this is what you're gonna see. This is one heartbeat. So you've got the P wave, which is atrial systole, or the depolarization of the atrial muscle. So this is when that electrical impulse first starts. Now in this image, you're gonna see that it's peaked. It's actually supposed to be rounded with no notches, so remember that. Uh, but this was the best image I could find for our purposes. So again, this is where the atria, the SA node is going to initially send down that impulse. Then we've got the QRS complex, 
And this is ventricular systole or when the ventricle muscles are contracting, the depolarization of that ventricle muscle. So that's the QRS. Then next up we've got the T wave. We've got the T wave, which is ventricular diastole, which is the repolarization of the ventricle muscles, which is basically just means that it's relaxing. And this should be slightly rounded with no notches. All right, so we're gonna go through some electrode or lead placement. So first off, you've got your V1 and your V2. Now, these are gonna both be on the fourth intercostal space. The V1 is gonna to be to the right of the sternum and V2 is gonna be in the left of the sternum. So if you come up to this image, we've got one, two, three, and then four is where your V1 is going to go. And then just across on the other side, you're gonna have your V2. Next, we've got V3, which just needs to be in between V2 and V4. Then V4 needs to be in the fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line. So that midclavicular line, if you can imagine the clavicle that's sitting up here, it just needs to be in the middle where that clavicle is. And then you come down to the fifth intercostal space. So again, we have one, two, three, four, and then five. After that, you're gonna put in your V5, which is gonna be in between V4 and V6. And then V6 is actually gonna be at the mid axillary line. So it's actually just gonna be lining up with underneath the armpit, if you can imagine where the armpit would be on the side of your patient. And then you've got your right upper arm, which is gonna be right here, your left upper arm, which is right here. And then you've got your legs, which are here and here. All right, so now I wanna show you how I place it when I'm actually putting this on a patient because finding all of your sites can be really hard, especially if your patient is obese in any way, shape or form. Honestly, unless your patient's like super, super skinny, it's a hard to find these intercostal spaces. So I'm gonna show you a trick that I've started using with mine. First off, I V1 and V2 are usually pretty easy to find because you can mostly fill where their sternum is. And again, remember that this can be kind of painful when you're doing this to people if you push too hard trying to find these spaces, but you can push and you can feel the ribs and so you can kind of guess where that intercostal space is going to be. Remember though that sometimes when we check on people to see if they're responsive, we do a sternal rub. So it's a very sensitive area if you're pushing too hard on it. So be aware of that. Okay, and so V1 and V2 are usually really easy to find. After that, I usually go ahead and put on V4 because that's in another intercostal space. So it's a little bit easier for me to feel where that space is going to be and it's really easy to line up with the clavicle. After that, I'm gonna pop back over to V6 and that goes in the mid-axillary line because again, I've got some areas that are really easy to line up with. So I just need to line up with that underarm and line up with V4. Then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna go ahead and place V5 and V3 and then the arms and the legs are very easy to place. You just wanna make sure that they're not on a bony prominence because these electrodes are, are picking up electrical impulses in the skin. And if you put them on the bone, it can block that electrical impulse a little bit and makes your read come out kind of funny. So then our next image here is just an overlay with the heart so that you can look at this and have an idea of each of these leads and what they're picking up. So you can see that V1 is kind of on the right side of the heart. V2 is on the front of the heart. And V3, they're kind of by each other. Then we've got V4, 5, and 6 that are all on the side and kind of on the bottom of the heart. And then we've got our arms. So these are all going to interact with each other and pick up a different view of the heart. Now, I want you to pay attention really quick on how many electrodes we've actually placed on the patient at this point. So we have V1 through six, so that's six, and then we've got four on each limb. So we've got one, two, three, four. So that's actually a total of just 10. However, you're gonna hear people call something, say something called a 12 lead. And when you actually get this read out, you're going to get 12 different perspectives of the heart. So let's go into a 12 lead and what that actually looks like. So this is what a, a typical 12 lead might look like. They're, uh, depending on the maker and manufacturer and stuff of your equipment, it might print out a little bit differently, but essentially you're going to have, you're, right here you're gonna have one, two, and three. You're gonna have AVR, AVL, and AVF. And then you're gonna have V1, two, 
three, four, five, six. So what I was saying earlier is that those arm leads are gonna interact with your six other leads and they're gonna create these other viewpoints. But I'm not gonna get too much into that because that's really just a, a very specific part of EKGs that don't matter as much. What you need to know is how you're gonna read things. So to go into this a little bit, we've got the lateral side of the heart. So you can look over here and you can see this heart. So we've got the lateral side of the heart and you're gonna remember that that's where V5 and V6 were. And then it's also gonna interact with the AVL and two and one over here. And that's gonna give you a lateral view of the heart. So if you look at these electrical impulses, they all look a little bit differently, right? Because as those electrical impulses flow from one to the other, whoops. Because as those electrical impulses flow from one side of the heart to the other, it's gonna go up when it detects more amplitude, right? And then this is our timing. So each of these amplitudes and voltage is what it's detecting. So then we've got the inferior part of our heart. So if you look over here at the heart right here, we've got two, three, and AVF that are gonna read those for us. Then you've got the septum and then the septum and the anterior. So I did both of these together because this one is V1 and V2, which are gonna be on either side of your sternum, right? And they're really gonna get the septum of the heart. But then V3 and V4 are really close to that. Um, and they, they pick up some of the septum as well as just the anterior portion of the heart. So they do overlap just a little bit when you're looking at it on a 12 lead. All right, next up, the thing that's most important, again, like I've said, is that you need to understand normal sinus rhythm. When you understand that normal sinus rhythm looks like, you'll be able to recognize when someone has a dysrhythmia. But always make sure that you're assessing your patient because the machine might show a dysrhythmia, but your patient could be sitting quietly and reading a magazine with no signs of distress. So you may need to assess your electrode placement or your patient may have a tolerance to some types of dysrhythmias that they've had during their life. So again, make sure that you're assessing your patient. That's the most important thing that you can do as a nurse. All right, so we're gonna review this again to make sure that there's some understanding here. We've got the P wave. This should be rounded without peaking or notching. So remember, this should be a rounded, it should look more like on this image what the T wave looks like. Then you've got your QRS complex. This should be less than 0.12 seconds. This is also the depolarization of the ventricles. Then you've got the T wave. This should be slightly rounded, also without peaking or notching, and it represents the repolarization of the ventricles. So this is when they're relaxing and refilling with blood. It is hypothesized that you can't see the repolarization of the atria on the EKG because the depolarization of the ventricles is so strong that it covers it up. Then you've got your ST segment. So remember that we've got the, if this is your QRS, so where the S ends and the T begins, that is your ST segment, and this is the early ventricular repolarization. So remember, this T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. So this is just that early repolarization. Then you've got the PR interval. This represents the time that it takes for the electrical impulse to travel from the SA node to the AV node and then to the Purkinje fibers. So this is what it also reflects the proper functioning of the AV node. So if the pulse is coming out of the SA node where it starts, and then it gets to the AV node and the AV node is not functioning, then it's never gonna get to the Purkinje fibers and do a full heartbeat like we need it to do. So this helps us know whether or not that AV node is fully functioning as it should. Then we've got our QT interval. This represents the total amount of time that it takes for the ventricles to depolarize and repolarize. And then we've got the RR interval, and this represents the time between each heartbeat and helps us recognize the rhythm. So for a normal sinus rhythm, there should be equal distance between all of the RR intervals. Then here's another image that might help you if you're a little bit more color-coded. So right here, this is the same thing. So we've got our P wave, 
we've got our QRS complex, we've got our T wave, and then you might see a U wave, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And then right here you've got your PR interval and your QT interval. And then it's what's not covered in here is the RR interval, so that's from one R to another R that might be somewhere over here. But this breaks down one heartbeat for you in a different way. And then really quick about the U, uh, this is not seen very commonly. You might see this in a couple of people. It's very uncommon to see a U wave. If you do see it, it can be indicative of hypokalemia. So just be aware of that. All right, so just remember what's the most important thing that you can do is to know what normal looks like and then assess, assess, and assess. Even if your patient is showing abnormal EKG or ECG rhythms, it might be that your equipment is not on properly, something's fallen off, or it might be that they're tolerating it okay, and that needs to take part in your treatment plan. So quick review, electrical conduction, it starts in the SA node, goes through the AV node, through the bundle of His to the Purkinje fibers. And then when the muscle fibers come in contact with that electrical impulse, that's what contracts it and then forces the blood through the circulatory system. The EKG strips are made up of little squares and big squares. There's five little squares to make up a big square, and five big squares equals one second on a strip. An EKG pattern is made up of a P wave, a QRS complex, a T wave, and sometimes a U wave, though very uncommon. And then know what normal looks like, because the more you recognize normal, the better help you will recognizing when something is wrong. So is your patient sick or not sick? Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Please help me grow my channel by clicking subscribe and follow below. 